Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm so happy to see your faces, some of your faces, some of your names. Um, thank you so much for joining and a very big thank you to our special guest, advocate Rachel Gershoni, who has joined us today. Uh, welcome to this online lecture on combating human trafficking, hosted by Mashab, Israel's Agency for International Development. Um, we're really happy to see you all. And before we start, I just want to give you a few logistics. First of all, your microphones are muted. So if you have any questions, please make sure to use the chat. It's open to everyone. Um, please make sure to write your questions in the chat and, uh, and we'll try to get to, to them at the end of the lecture. The lecture is also being recorded uh, and it will be put on our YouTube link uh, after, after this, this uh, recording. If you would not like to be recorded, please make sure to turn off your video. So now I will just give a, sh a short introduction to advocate Rachel Gershoni. Mashav has had many years of cooperation and we're very lucky to have uh, one of the leading world experts on combating human trafficking with us today. Rachel Gershoni has been a lawyer for the past 20, 39 years specializing in the field of criminal justice and evidence. She has served as a defense advocate, as deputy director of Israel's antitrust authority, and as a director in Israel's Ministry of Justice, where she drafted legislation and legal opinions in both civil and criminal divisions. Her experience in combating trafficking in persons spans 19 years, during which she drafted Israel's anti-trafficking legislation, served as Israel's national anti-trafficking coordinator, and worked in UNODC's Human Trafficking and Migrant Smuggling Section in Vienna. She currently continues to do anti-trafficking work with Israeli prosecutors and NGOs and serves as a consultant for UNODC around the world. Thank you so much for joining us, Advocate Rachel Gershoni, and I'm passing the mic on to you. Okay. <clears throat> So good afternoon to all of you, and I'm glad to see that some of you are brave enough to show your faces. I wish there would be more of you who would be so brave so I could see who you are. Anyway, I went over the registration. I see you're from many countries and from many kinds of organizations, some from government, some from NGOs, some from business universities, judiciary, and hospital and medical personnel. So this is a very wide range and I'm hoping for questions from all of you. Um, I tried to go over your questions and I found a certain pattern that I wanna focus on. Um, many of you ask questions relating to traffic victims' vulnerability. <clears throat> so I would like to focus on vulnerability from various standpoints, because in my opinion, it's key to every single case on trafficking, and it forms its subtext of every case and every court ruling. Why is this so? Because as we can understand, traffickers target vulnerable people. Why? Because they're easier to recruit, and they're easier to exploit. They don't have many alternatives. So for that reason, vulnerability becomes a key aspect of trafficking, even if it's not an element of the crime. So first of all, I'd like to discuss the root causes of trafficking. One gentleman, I think it was from Ethiopia, asked about poverty as a root cause of trafficking. In my opinion, vulnerabilities as a whole are root causes of trafficking. We see that the United Nations protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons actually takes on a holistic view. It is not enough to prosecute traffickers. One needs to protect the victims because without the victims, we cannot develop cases. And it is necessary also to prevent trafficking. Because if we don't try to prevent trafficking, then we're just like that Dutch boy with his finger in the dam. We're trying to stop a flood with, what, with our finger. So one of the methods of prevention, according to the protocol, is that states take measures to alleviate the factors that make persons vulnerable to trafficking. 
and it enumerates poverty, underdevelopment, and lack of equal opportunity. Why are these aspects root causes of trafficking? Well, because people who are impoverished, people without equal opportunity, are desperate, very often desperate. They will believe the lies of the traffickers much more easily than people who are not in such desperate situations because they want to believe. And one thing that I have gathered from my work with victims is people need bread to live, but people need hope to live. And if that means believing something that other people would suspect, that's what happens. In addition to that, the vulnerable people are easier to exploit because they have low expectations of life. If the traffic situation is even a little better than what they experienced in their uh, homes of origin, then they'll accept it. They'll even view the trafficker as their best friend. And I've heard this from victims over and over again. Also, even if they see how terrible the situation is, they have fewer alternatives. What are they going to return to? So if states are going to take seriously uh, combating trafficking, they also have to combat poverty, underdevelopment, and lack of equal opportunity. I remember in one conference in Rome, in the very early days when I was uh, starting to deal with trafficking, an Albanian nun said something very profound, which I never forgot. She said, it's not enough to have in information campaigns. You can give people any information you like if you don't give them hope if you don't give them recourse, if you don't give them jobs, if you don't give them some, some opportunities, they're going to go with the traffickers. And we know that traffic victims are re-trafficked over and over again because of this. So in that sense, vulnerabilities are a root cause of trafficking. Now, when we talk about vulnerabilities, however, what, what do we really mean? The only vulnerability is not poverty, obviously. There are countless kinds of vulnerability. Vulnerable disabilities, uh, addictions, uh, lack of education, uh, immigration status, age, problematic family history, emotional vulnerabilities. Sometimes it's hard to see how a person is vulnerable with a naked eye. I remember once uh, being with the Ministry of Interior representative, and she said to me, oh, this woman whom we're seeing now couldn't possibly be a victim because she, look how she's dressed. She's dressed in a suit. She's carrying a briefcase. She's very confident. That's not a victim. Hmm, is that so? The head of the United States Office to Monitor Trafficking once said something very very, that left me with a big impression. Victims come in many shapes and sizes, and so do vulnerabilities. We may see a woman standing in a suit with a briefcase. She may not show her vulnerability, but she may be vulnerable. And here, again, I want to convey to you um, a, an insight that I heard from an Israeli prosecutor whose name is Dalia Avramov. Dahlia said that traffickers are like deer hunters. They have a capacity, they have a special talent to identify vulnerabilities, even if we don't see them. Now, <clears throat> in a certain Israeli case called Ambash, <clears throat> the victims seemed to be non-vulnerable. They were articulate, intelligent Israeli women, citizens of Israel, with families. <clears throat> so where was their vulnerability? Well, in that case, the judge dug deeper. And that's what we need to do, to dig deeper. And he found that these people were lost and damaged souls with an attraction toward religion who were in crisis and searched for direction and a path in their lives. He also stressed their problematic family backgrounds, and the injuries they had suffered in their past lives. So some injuries, some vulnerabilities cannot be obvious. 
And I want to give you an example of something we call emotional vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, in trafficking, we see a prevalence of family members who traffic their family members. We also see a prevalence of a people who pretend to be romantic partners of the victims and traffic them. The, these kind of situations create emotional vulnerabilities. Why? Because if the trafficker is your family member or your romantic partner, you love him or her. You trust him or her. Even when you find out the truth, and sometimes it takes a long time for you to realize the truth because the person is a loved person, it, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna report him or her, and you don't want to testify against him or her. And moreover, in many cases, such trafficking completely destroys the, the trust that the victim has in the world. And that means the trust that the victim will have in people from NGOs, from law enforcement. He has lost trust in the world. I want to give you an example from a South African case by the name of uh, State versus Mabuza. Very difficult case. It's a case of uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation of young children from Mozambique to South Africa. These children were trafficked for sexual exploitation, and one of the traffickers was the aunt of part of the children and the friend of the parents of the other children. So she was trusted, she was known. Now, one of the, when the children were finally rescued, one of them refused to report on her own exploitation. The school principal, the social worker, the police saw her, she refused to report. And only when she saw the other children testifying and she saw that the prosecutor could be trusted, only then did she come forth. When she was asked by the, by the, the judge why she did not come forth before that, she said she was ashamed and she trusted no one until she saw that the other children had freely revealed what they underwent to the prosecutor and felt he could be trusted. Here I want to say in parentheses, this shows us whatever we do in regard to trafficked people, it's important for us to do a wider task, and that's to, to develop trust, to be reliable, to not make promises we can't actually fulfill, because these people's trust has been abused, always. And in cases of family and romantic attachment, even more so. I want to give you another example, very uh, strong example of a Canadian case by the name of Urizar. This is a case of a person who presented himself as a romantic partner. The victim was an 18 year old girl uh, who was not in good relations with her family. And he treated her very well at first, which is also a facet of trafficking. We see it very often. At first, the trafficker treats the victim well and then gradually begins to abuse, abuse him or her. In any case, he asked her to do uh, exotic dancing and give, her all, give him all her earnings. He began to abuse her physically, verbally, emotionally. She was with him for nine months and tried to escape a few times, but kept coming back. A, when the court asked her, well, why did you stay there for nine months? She said she did not have the courage to make a complaint because she loved the accused. She felt torn between the love she felt for him and the abuse he subjected her to. So here we see emotional vulnerability. It's not something you see with your eyes. You don't see the ragged clothing. You don't see the disability. You don't see the signs of addiction, but it exists. And indeed, these two forms of, uh, of uh, vulnerability or emotion, emotional vulnerability are so prevalent <clears throat> that certain states have even uh, legislated about them. And for example, in uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, Djibouti, Niger, uh, they have aggravated sentencing for people 
family members who traffic their family members. And in terms of romantic uh, vulnerability, in, in Holland, it, is so, it, it was so prevalent that they gave it a name. It's called lover boy cases. So this is, this is vulnerability, which is not necessarily seen. Now, vulnerability is actually a key factor in trafficking in person cases, in court cases. Why? Well, the protocol actually refers to vulnerability in one of the elements of the crime. I don't know how familiar you are with the, the protocol and, and how it defines trafficking. So in brief, it defines trafficking by means of three elements, an act, which can be recruiting, transporting, harboring, a means, which is a foul means like force, coercion, uh, threats, and a purpose of exploitation, which can be forced labor, prostitution, uh, removal of organs. Now, among the means is a mean called abuse of a position of vulnerability. Right? In this, the protocol recognizes that Vulnerability is a key element of trafficking, or can be. Um, now, what about national systems? Do, does every state have such a means of abuse of position of vulnerability? The answer is no. I see that some of you are from Kenya, or at least those who registered are from Kenya. So Kenya does have a means of abuse of position of vulnerability. On the other hand, I saw that there are, there are some people from Nepal. Nepal does not. So is vulnerability only relevant to states which include this element in the definition of trafficking? The answer is no. Whether or not your legislation alludes to vulnerability, it's key and can make the whole difference between exoneration and conviction. Why is this so? This is so because in every case of trafficking, victims behave in a way which is surprising. A, a Namibian judge, I think he was the deputy, he is the deputy chief justice of the, their Supreme Court, said something uh, very interesting here. He said, vulnerable people do not behave like you and me. They behave differently. And in order to understand their behavior, we have to take into account their vulnerability. Well, so what kind of behavior seems surprising? And we'll deal with it in, yet in more depth uh, later. Well, first of all, we look at the, the victim was recruited uh, by means of deception, which was very clear that it was a lie. How did they believe it? The victim stayed with, uh, I've seen cases where victims stayed with their abusers for 20 years. Well, why? He had opportunities. He could have, he could have gone, uh, he could have escaped when, uh, when uh, they allowed him to go to the grocery store. Okay. The basic overreaching question that arises in trafficking cases is why is this victim behaving differently than I would? as a judge, as a prosecutor, as a police officer, as an NGO. And if the judge understands the vulnerability, then he will understand, aha, this person was vulnerable. That's why he's behaving that way. But if he doesn't understand the vulnerability, he's liable to exonerate. I wanna give you two examples of Israeli cases where this made all the difference and it's particularly interesting because is, Israel does not have a requirement of means at all. In other words, vulnerability does not appear in the Israeli law. And yet, vulnerability made the whole difference. So in, in one case, the case that failed, was a case of a charismatic uh, leader who gathered around him a group of women and children and controlled every aspect of their lives. Even, they couldn't even buy a bottle of water without asking for his permission. They weren't allowed to speak to one another. They weren't allowed to uh, work in anything but, <clears throat> but uh, taking care of um, a domestic work or, a, or cleaning work. 
uh, he, he persuaded them to give him all their earnings in order to finance his uh, luxurious lifestyle. The court exonerated him from slavery. And the reason that the court exonerated him was because they couldn't understand the victim's vulnerability. They said, look, these are Israeli citizens, articulate, intelligent, who came from normative family backgrounds. They knew very well the difference between a normative life and the life that they led under the uh, accused person. So why didn't they leave? He didn't exert violence. It was only psychological means. In other words, the judges could not understand where was the vulnerability? Why were these women not behaving as I would behave? Well, in a similar case, which I already mentioned, the Ambash case, very similar. It's very interesting. I didn't know how many charismatic people there were in Israel who gathered around themselves, women and children, but apparently it is some kind of phenomenon because now there's a th third case that I saw. Anyway, in this case, again, charismatic man gathers around uh, the group of women and, and children and uh, first treats them well, gradually begins to abuse them, controls every aspect of their life. Again, articulate, intelligent Israeli citizens coming from normative backgrounds. But here, the judge dug deeper. And as I, I, I uh, quoted him before, he found the vulnerabilities. He found that even though they seemed to be just regular Israeli uh, citizens with normative backgrounds, they were lost souls searching for a path in life. Some of them had hard family backgrounds. Some of them, one of them, for example, he found that she had a psychological disability, which was not uh, evident at first, and she had been divorced three times, not that there was anything wrong with that, but she had been divorced three times. And she um, a also, let me see what else he said about her. Yes. Hmm. No, oh, I guess that's about all he said about her. In, so we see here the judge dug deeper and, and the, the person was convicted. Look at the differences here. In one case, in the Ambash case, the second case, there was violence, which there wasn't in the first case, which also helped to convict. But the, the question of vulnerability made a, a vast difference, a huge difference between the two cases. In the first case, the judges could not see where the vulnerability was and said, well, clearly these person chose to, to be there, they are not traffic victims. In the second case, the judge looked a little deeper, saw the vulnerabilities, and was able to understand that these people were actually trafficked, and that the person, the accused, made use of these vulnerabilities, abused these vulnerabilities. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in trafficking, anybody who has uh, read a few trafficking cases sees that there are typical evidential problems in these cases. The prime example is seeming consent to the exploitation. In case after case after case, we will see statements of victims such as, I chose to do this, this was my best alternative, I want to remain, the trafficker is like a father to me, the trafficker is my best friend, or, the victim shows by his behavior that he seemingly consents. He fails to escape and seek help at the first opportunity. He returns to the abuser time and time again, as we saw in the Canadian case. Two victims can have very different reactions to the same trafficking a, a process. How do, we, how do we explain this? Well, one of the ways that we can explain these typical evidential issues is by means of vulnerability. And here I would like to give you a few examples. One is a case from the United Kingdom, the Connors case. It's a case of homeless men, uh, who were, many of whom were addicted to alcohol, 
who were recruited by the members of a family who had a landscaping business. And they were abused physically, emotionally, humiliated, and verbally. Uh, they lived in horrendous conditions, no safety measures. In one case, somebody, uh, one of the victims fell from a uh, height. He was taken to the hospital, but forced to come back to the site after a day or two. So these were horrendous conditions, okay? Now, some of the victims fled, but the others remained. And the question arose, well, why? Doesn't this impugn their credibility? If it was so bad, why not, why not escape? Others did, why not you? Well, here the court, the, again, dug deeper. And this is, if any of you are judges, any of you are police or prosecutors, this is my, uh, a main message, dig deeper. Trafficking cases require us to dig deeper. So what did the judge say? I, I really love this. I'm going to just read it to you because it's such a, a powerful quote. He says, one manifestation of the level of control was that many of those exploited were effectively deprived of the will to leave. Others were too demoralized to seek to leave. And yet others believed that the world outside had nothing better to offer them. This, wow. Here's the judge saying, the world outside had nothing better to offer them. Vulnerability. Where did they have to go? They were homeless. They were impoverished. They had nothing. Vulnerability can be a way of explaining evidential weaknesses. Another example, which I'm actually rereading right now because it had a very, very good uh, insight in this case. It's an Australian case by the name of Kovacs. Here, it was a Filipino woman who was trafficked into Australia, and she was both sexually abused and abused in a labor context. Now, she worked in a takeaway store in full view of the public every day, and yet for five months, she did not seek help, and she did not uh, try to escape. Now, the court, uh, understood this behavior as a function of her vulnerabilities. Her family was in a situation of dire poverty, and she had come to Australia to try to send them money. Her mother was very ill, and she didn't want to add to her problems. She was not fluent in English. She did not have one friend in Australia. She didn't understand the culture of Australia so that when the accused told her that if she, she divulged anything, she would be arrested, she believed him. So here we see that the court does not see her failure to escape as a weakness in the case. The court understands this failure in the context of her vulnerabilities. Where could she go? Who did she have to turn to? Another extreme case, which I must, even though I don't have much time, but I, I must uh, give you the story of this case because it's, it's so powerful. It's a Norwegian case. And uh, in this case, a couple who was of Filipino a, a origin go to the Philippines in order to interview women to be au pairs in their house in Norway. And they interviewed around 50 uh, Filipino women. And in the end, they come to the conclusion two would be fitting. Now they go back, the couple goes back to Norway and they, they engage in a, in a process of chats and emails with the women. And at first, the chats are innocent, but as time goes on, it becomes increasingly clear that the husband will require, in addition to domestic services, sexual services. Despite the fact that this is clear, both women travel to Norway. One arrives six months before the other, and she is reluctant to engage in, in these sexual relations, but the husband said, but you agreed. And by the way, in parentheses, this is very strong. When somebody says to you, but you agreed, it's strong. You say, oh yes, I agree. That's why in every, NGO, uh, which deals with uh, victims of sexual assault, 
it, it says on the wall, you can say no at any stage. Why, did, why does it, they have to say that? Because it's so strong when people say, but you agree. In addition, he says, well, <clears throat> if you don't do it, you'll have to pay for your ticket back to the Philippines. And in addition, he says, well, and people may find out what you agreed to do. So she does agree, and she engages in sexual uh, relations with him. The second victim arrives six months later, and she refuses and seeks help. Now, the, the, the husband is accused of trafficking for sexual uh, exploitation, and he's convicted both in the first instance and the appeals, in the Court of Appeals. And there are many reasons that he's convicted, despite the fact that in this case, it seems so clear that these women consented. These women knew very well what they were going to, right? Well, the Court of Appeals said two things. One of the two things was that the vulnerability of the victims had been abused. In other words, their consent was damaged. They, there was not full and genuine consent here. They were poor women. They were in a foreign country. They probably didn't know the language too well. Their vulnerability was, was abused. So here again, we see vulnerability as a very powerful uh, and key aspect of the conviction. The court also said something else, which is also powerful, but not relating to uh, vulnerability, and that is one cannot consent to one's own exploitation. This is a very a powerful statement, but unfortunately, if one of you wants to ask about it afterwards, consent, then I can answer, but I, can, I have to go off. Suspense. Okay, now I wanna go on to child trafficking. Several of you asked about child trafficking, and naturally, young age is a particular kind of vulnerability. And it is so important that the protocol actually um, mentions it explicitly and establishes that whereas in adult trafficking, we need three elements in order to convict, the act, the means, the purpose of exploitation, in child trafficking, we need only two elements, and that's an act and a purpose of exploitation. Why don't we need a means, force, abusive position of vulnerability? I think the reason is because this conforms to the reality of child trafficking. There is no need to employ foul means in order to persuade a child to come with you. A child is very persuadable. The fact that you're an adult may be enough. And um, I'm going to give you an example of, of a case in which just promising the children to eat in a popular food outlet was enough to persuade them. So for that reason, the protocol uh, establishes that it's enough if there's an act and a purpose of exploitation. Now, what are some particular issues which arise in regard to child trafficking? Well, first of all, if we're talking about child trafficking for slavery, for labor, servitude, in the labor context, there arises the question of standards. Is forced labor for a child the same as forced labor for an adult? Should it be wider? Is any kind of violation of child labor laws to be considered trafficking? Well, these are value-laden questions, and countries answer them in different ways. In some countries, it's enough that there were violations of child labor laws to constitute forced labor, slavery, or servitude, because inherently children, it's severe when these these, uh, um, these uh, labor laws are violated. The labor laws in children are different than labor laws for adults. Labor laws for adults 
are protective, but child labor laws are more protective. So certain jurisdictions see, see any violation of labor laws as enough to constitute trafficking. Others think that only very severe kinds should constitute. Here I want to give you an example of a case from the Philippines. I mentioned the Philippines a lot, but it happens to have <laughs> many uh, good cases. So here is the Dinaga case. And here, um, the female perpetrator convinced some children and forced others to come with her. She promised them that she would take them to eat at a popular food outlet and would then, they would then eat fruit in her house. The children were between the ages of five and nine. And she then persuaded them to beg and took all the earnings that they got from begging. She was convicted of trafficking for forced labor. Now, forced labor requires a lack of voluntariness. So what did the court see as the lack of voluntary behavior by the children? Her inducement to feed them food that they particularly liked. I, I wonder if, if that would have been the case for an adult. Perhaps it would have been a, the case for an adult with a disability. But a regular adult promising him to give him food a, you know, that's a, a, in a popular outlet, I don't think would be considered a, 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 enough of an inducement to constitute forced labor. There's another case from the United States, Kosvinsky, in which they say this in, in a very direct way. They say a child who is told that he must go home late at night in the dark through a strange area may be subject to physical coercion that results in his staying in an exploitative situation, although a competent adult plainly would not be. This is very interesting. You tell an adult, well, you'll just have to go home at night alone, so he'll go home at night alone. But that's not the case for a child. In that case, it might be considered a situation of forced labor, slavery, servitude. So that's one question, particular question, which arises in regard to child trafficking. Another question is the cultural context. And naturally, this is also the case in, with adults, but with children, there are various cultural uh, customs. For example, I worked a lot in the Southern African region, and I know that there, there's a practice of children herding cattle. In the Pacific Islands, there's a, a custom of letting children or having children uh, go to distant relatives on another island where they sometimes work very hard. There are customs in the United States of America, when my husband was a child on a dairy farm, where children work very hard before school, doing chores, after school doing chores. And among some ethnic groups, it's acceptable to send children to bed. So should these cultural practices be factored in? Should they provide a defense to cases of trafficking in persons? The most wonderful case that I know in this regard is from South Africa. It's the Jazeel case. And it's not in a labor context, but rather in a sexual exploitation context. Here, a young minor girl of 14 was married to a man in his 30s and against her will. And he was accused of trafficking for sexual exploitation. For his defense, he claimed this was a customary marriage. And her uncles had actually um, forced her to do this. Now, the court called for amicus curiae briefs on what is customary marriage. In the end, the court came to the conclusion on the basis of these briefs that this was not a customary marriage. It was an aberrant customary marriage because customary marriages did consider the consent of the child. They convicted him of trafficking for sexual exploitation. And um, however, they did uh, mitigate his sentence because he genuinely believed he had been engaging in a customary marriage. Now, some countries actually have legislation which alludes to cultural practices. 
Zimbabwe and Zambia, for example, clearly state their trafficking laws. Cultural practices and beliefs are not a defense to trafficking in persons cases. In other countries like Uganda, child marriage is expressly included as a purpose of exploitation. Now, in addition to this, there are a few cases regarding children sent to beg in Roma families, and there is no unity between how, among countries, how they deal with this. Thailand has a very interesting uh, approach where if the whole family is begging, then a, they do not uh, charge the uh, parents because they think it, they're doing it for survival. There's no intention of exploitation. However, if only the children are sent to beg, then uh, they do a, a charge. Um, okay, now I wanted to talk about the impact of vulnerability on victim identification. Several of you asked how, how do we identify victims? And of course, there are many tools, many uh, organizations have developed tools how to, how to um, identify victims of trafficking. Uh, UNODC, ILO, uh, uh, the Polaris Project, there are many, many uh, kinds of indicators. Um, however, I at this point will limit myself to the question of how vulnerabilities influence our ability to identify. First of all, um, I'm very frustrated very often by police who wait for complaints. Now, trafficking victims do not usually self-report for any number of reasons. First of all, they may not consider themselves victims. Second of all, they may not be in a position where they can <laughs> a, a report. They're in isolation. Um, it's, of course, far better to be proactive and identify what are the weakest links in your society. Because among those weakest links, there will be trafficking, without a doubt. Traffickers draw their victims from these weakest links of society. These can be foreign workers. These can be domestic servants who the umbrella of labor law does not always uh, cover. Uh, it can be ethnic minorities, impoverished people, people who are addicted. There was a very difficult case in South Africa, the Ease case, in which addicted young women were trafficked and controlled by the trafficker giving them or not giving them their drugs. So this this kind of proactive identification of the weakest links and, and making priorities. Okay, now we are going to go and we are going to check what's happening in the agricultural section. And of course, this requires also coordination with other um, practitioners, labor inspectors, for example. Police can't do this by themselves. So hospital personnel, social workers, NGOs. So this is one way I would say that <clears throat> vulnerabilities impact on identification. In order to identify, we need to be proactive and we need to be proactive with the weakest links in the society. Another way, as I said, victims do not usually self-report. And this is partially besides uh, the fact that uh, some of them can't report because they're in conditions of isolation. It also arises from vulnerable victims' low expectations of life. Um, so if victims do not consider themselves victims, obviously it becomes harder to identify them. So in this way too, I would say that vulnerabilities impact on our ability to identify. And this is another reason why we need to be proactive. Another subject with some of you raised was how can the public help combat trafficking? <clears throat> can the public help? Well here, uh, again, I think that the crucial role that the public can play 
is recognized in various countries' laws. Israel is one of them, but in many Southern, in many African uh, nations, I've noticed that there's a duty to report. The public has a duty to report if they think that there is a trafficking situation. What is this, what's the reason behind this? Well, the purpose is to transform the community into many pairs of eyes and ears, all of which are alert to signs of trafficking and thus make the ground under the traffickers too hot to hold them. These laws also recognize that in trafficking situations, often victims can't complain, either because they're imprisoned or because isolated or psychologically under the sway of the trafficker. So, but, but can the public really help? Well, I think, I think the public can. First of all, in identification. There, if you, and this, these are all, all actually uh, uh, examples which I take from my own experience. If you hear screaming every night from a neighboring residence, this may be a sign. Does a domestic worker exit only to take the garbage out? This may be a sign. Do you observe that on a work site, the conditions are dangerous? Do you observe that farm workers are working in living conditions without running water, without heat? without cooling facilities, without adequate food, all these may be indicators. This is not just a supposition on my part. I can point to you cases, actual court cases, in which the identification was initially done by uh, members of the public. The Mabuza case, which I uh, mentioned uh, formerly of the Mozambican children, who first identified the exploitation of the children the wife of one of the workers on the site where they were being ex exploited. In an, a US case, a representative of legal aid was the uh, identifier. In another case, an Indian case, this was really, I couldn't believe it when I read it, but it happened. The wife of the trafficker went through a course on the phenomenon of trafficking and, and reported her husband's crime. Very interesting, the Srivedi case of India. In another case, an anonymous tip from the public led the police to the criminal. This is a case in West Bengal. In Israel, members of a Filipino community organization identified. Okay, so that's one thing the public can do. Keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. If you see something, suspicious reported. But there's more. There's also rescue support and protection. And here I can give you ex actual examples from cases. For example, we mentioned the COVAX case of Australia, the one where the woman worked in the takeaway establishment. Who rescued this woman? It was the estranged daughter of the trafficker. The woman had no friends in Australia, at one point, the trafficker went on a vacation and his estranged daughter came to the house and the woman broke down. This woman helped her, gave her money and, and rescued her, allowed her to escape, gave her a ticket. Another case is the Ramos case in the United States where transport workers who passed through the site and saw the exploitation rescued the workers. In the case of Warren, a nun, who had come to the site rescue. In the case of the Alzanki, United States case, a nurse helped. So we see that rescue. And I myself have experienced a few cases where clients of prostitution, whom the women told their story to, actually bought the women and thus rescued them. This is from my own experience. Now, in addition to that, if you're a health professional or run a hairdressing salon, perhaps leaving a few leaflets on the table, because sometimes this my hairdresser told me actually, 
which uh, is kind of a funny uh, experience. He said, oh yes, you know that the pimps are bringing all the traffic women to my hairdressing establishment because they have to look good. So I guess sometimes traffic people come to hairdressing establishments. Sometimes they might be taken to a doctor. I know that this happened in Israel to a certain clinic, which we have in Tel Aviv. So if you have leaflets on the table, giving the women or giving the men a place that they can call, or what can they do? This could help. There are volunteer professionals like psychologists and social workers who volunteer to help victims. And there are businesses. For example, in Israel, the shelter mediated with certain businesses who gave trafficked women jobs. And so these are all things that members of the public can do. Um, I, huh, I actually uh, have run out of time, but I do want to say one last thing, concluding thoughts before your question. This was something that actually came to me when I was in a workshop in Zambia from lack of sleep. Because when you have lack of sleep, it's like a drug. So your mind is working in a way better. So I thought to myself, you know, wow, you know, trafficking is a severe crime. It violates the autonomy, the dignity, and the freedom of the human being, okay? But if we, if we look at the elements of the crime and we interpret it technically, we can come to absurd results. I don't know if any of you have read uh, the American book, Tom Sawyer. Just raise your hands, you who are, are whose faces I see. Uh, ah, I see two people have read Tom Sawyer. Okay, well, I'll tell the story. This is a book uh, about a boy, uh, a boy, you know, in the south of the United States. Okay, so at one point, his Aunt Polly punishes him. And she says, you will get a punishment. You have to paint the fence. So he starts painting the fence. I think it's on a Sunday. And a group of children gather around him and start laughing at him. Ha, 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 you have to paint the fence. And he says, wow, I am having so much fun. This is the best in the world. I wouldn't let anyone do this. Well, uh, and, no, and the children say, wow, what's so He said, look, look how I'm painting it. It's just coming out so great. And the children say, oh, can we do it? Can we? No, 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 you can't do it. Please, can we do it? Please, we'll give you some. Please, can we do it? Oh, all right. In the end, the other children end up painting the whole fence. Now, if we were analyzing this case as a case of trafficking, okay, all the elements are there. Tom Sawyer recruited the children, okay? He abused their vulnerability, even though in child trafficking, we don't even need that, okay? And they did forced labor because forced labor doesn't necessarily mean physically forced. It can also mean that he exerted psychological means. Okay? So Tom Sawyer trafficked these children. Now, this is an absurd result. This is not trafficking. In order to, to evaluate if something is trafficking, we need more than the bare elements of the crime. We have to get a feel is this severe enough? Is this a case where the autonomy, dignity, and freedom of the human being was violated? Is this <clears throat> against the moral imperative which the philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, um, uh, established? That one never treats a human being as only a means to an end, but also always as an end in himself. And I think this is the question we need to ask. Okay, questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for this, this extremely important and interesting talk, uh, Rachel. Thank you. And um, for giving us so many case studies and examples and from your vast experience. I'd like to start with the first question um, about this, what's happening now. So what is the situation with, human, with trafficking of human beings um, during this corona time, what's happening with COVID-19, and mm -hmm. um, what, what can we do? Mm. <clears throat> okay, so it's a question we're all asking ourselves. 
And of course, this period is not actually a period where we can do field research. So all I can do is speculate. And what I'm going to do is speculate on the basis of analogies and on the basis of things that we do know. So first of all, I would say that, unfortunately, this pandemic creates a very good climate to more easily recruit people and to more easily exploit them. Why? Well, again, vulnerability. Take the homeless. In the, in the period of the pandemic, we all need to be locked down in our homes. What about the homeless? What can they do? They're exposed to the, to the pandemic. Where will they go? They may even be arrested if they stay out. Wouldn't they be easier to recruit? And more than that, people who are trafficked during this pandemic, well, um, where, where will they escape to? They have no recourse. We're all isolated. In a way, the government is doing the work of the traffickers because they're isolating the victims because we're all isolated. So the vulnerable actually become more vulnerable. I ask myself also, could it be that there's a worsening of conditions for trafficked victims? And here I want to draw on the analogy of domestic violence and sexual assaults in the home. We do know that there have been increasing reports during this period of such uh, abuses. And I would say that homes have become a hotbed of tensions. So I assume that we could say that perhaps trafficking victims are now experiencing worse conditions than usual. In addition to the fact that, of course, in an economic, uh, in an economic situation, even traffickers are suffering. I mean, take traffickers for prostitution. Who's going to prostitutes nowadays? So tensions. Now also the seeming consent evidential problems. I mean, in this situation, <laughs> victims may really be consenting to be with the traffickers because it's better than being out on the street. Domestic servitude may be a more serious problem. The public will find it harder to identify who's being trafficked because nobody's going out of the house. So the fact that the, the uh, domestic servant is only going out of the house to throw out the garbage, that's no longer a, a signal to identify her as a victim of trafficking. Also, there are all, all sorts of cultural beliefs and practices which may be heightened during this uh, pandemic. For example, uh, in the United States where I was born, the high value, it's almost the highest value, is privacy. And that's actually an impediment to identifying victims of trafficking because a man's a home is his castle and therefore we will not interfere in what's going on in the home. Well, now look what's happening in the pandemic. Everybody's in the home. Nobody's out there. So of course it'll affect identification. It'll affect people's willingness to even hear or look at what's going on, nor do they have the, the ability. And of course, there are greater impediments to bring people to justice. Where are the law enforcement? They're basically uh, enforcing all kinds of rules like masks, even though in Israel, I noticed that they're not doing anything of the sort, but all right, most regular countries are enforcing the law. So do, are they really focusing on trafficking? Labor inspectors, who are very important, in identifying victims. Are they in the field? If they are in the field, how many are in the field? Public reporting. People are locked in their houses. They don't see what's going on. Coordination. We need to coordinate in order to fight trafficking. Are we able to coordinate? Are we able to meet together? Except by these means? And victim protection, here an analogy. Um, shelters of domestic uh, violence and sexual assault are in very bad situations. There's a bottleneck. People are not going out of the shelters, so new people can't come in. I assume it's the same for tra 
victims for, uh, shelters for victims of trafficking. In addition, the NGOs. Are the NGOs still in the field? How many of them are there? How, how, how can they go into the houses? So all these, uh, I, I was trying to find a point of consolation in that there aren't, um, uh, in, there aren't uh, flights from one country to another. So I said, oh, great. So there'll be lessening of trafficking. But unfortunately, uh, knowing as I do, the traffickers are very flexible and they very, uh, you know, rapidly uh, accommodate themselves to changing conditions. We may just see more domestic trafficking, unfortunately. So what can we do about this? Here I refer to a UNODC, um, a, I think it's recommendations from a thematic analysis of the impact of the pandemic on trafficking. Well, uh, one thing we can do is make available e-learning tools for practitioners. At least they can learn, they can continue to learn by uh, means of e courts also courts perhaps they can they can use technology to have hearings so that they're not put out of the commission of course states have to monitor how they can do it states should maintain a balance between play control and the human rights of of traffic victims and as soon as possible systematic data collection should be done that's about it. I was too lengthy. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. No, it's, it's a very important question, I think, and especially for, for what's happening now. Um, speaking of vulnerabilities, there was a question about um, the reality of vulnerable populations in refugee camps. Um, if you could touch upon that a little bit. Mm. Well, this is one of the, you know, uh, things I noticed when I first worked in UNODC. Refugees can also be victims of trafficking, and um, refugees are vulnerable people. So not only is it possible that refugees were also trafficked, but it's possible that refugees will be trafficked after they escape to the country of destination. And we've seen this in Israel. We've seen people from the Eritrean community who were trafficked in the Sinai Desert, and some of them have uh, submitted uh, requests to be considered uh, asylum seekers, to be considered refugees. And later on in Israel, they're trafficked. So I would say that refugee camps are a prime place where uh, NGOs, where government should be opening their eyes and their ears to see, are there traffic victims? And often there are. Thank you. Um, another question here is, what is the difference uh, between internal and international trafficking? Well, uh, look, the truth is the patterns are very similar. Just that in international trafficking, it's more complicated because in order to identify and in order to prosecute or to investigate, one must cooperate with the other country, okay? The patterns, as far as the methods of control, as far as the recruiting methods, as far as uh, the, mean, the, the kinds of exploitation are very similar, although of course, every country has its own uh, cultural uh, uh, milieu. But the real difficulties are how do, you, how do you bring people to justice when part of the, the, um, the acts were committed in one country and the other acts in another country. And this is, this is a tremendous challenge, I must, I must say. Okay, there's um, a question uh, specifically from Kenya. Um, so, uh, Anne wrote this, some of our jobless young people in Kenya have always been promised good jobs in Saudi Arabia. While there, we have learned of the great mistreatments accorded to them and their and refusal to leave. They, however, have obliged to go. Can we call this trafficking? Okay, I just want to understand something. These these jobless young men, um, 
go to Saudi Arabia, they, they're promised jobs there. What happens when they're in Saudi Arabia? Well, I don't know if Anne is still here, but what she wrote was that they, they have great mistreatments and uh, they're ah. not allowed to leave. And they're not allowed to ah. leave. Ah. Okay, okay. Yes, this definitely can be trafficking. And here I want to point to, because I, I'm very much interested in cultural and mm -hmm. uh, cultural practices which create climates friendly for trafficking. In Saudi Arabia and certain of the Gulf states, there's a system of kafala, which means that a foreign worker who is brought uh, to their shores cannot leave the employer, okay? He is bound to that employer. Naturally, this creates a climate friendly for trafficking because let's say the employer is abuse, abusive. What can he do? So I would say yes, there probably, we would have to see exactly what happened there in Saudi Arabia, but uh, the chances are that some of these uh, young men are being trafficked, yes. Okay. Um, there's a question here about uh, human organs, trafficking ah. of human organs. Mm -hmm. Can you touch a little bit upon, upon that? <clears throat> yeah, this is actually the form of trafficking that we know least about. Um, it presents very big practical and theoretical uh, problems. Theoretical problem is when is it trafficking organs and when is it trafficking human beings for organ removal? Now this may sound uh, very technical, but I'll give you two examples. Um, to go back a step, trafficking in organs is a regulatory offense with, you know, a punishment which was fitting for regulatory offenses. And the reason that it exists is in order to prevent exploitation, but a, the conditions for fulfilling these offenses are far less severe than we would require for traffickers, trafficking. For example, take a case where um, a, a person from the United States travels to uh, India a, in order to uh, have a kidney transplant. Now, the woman who's donating the uh, kidney a, gets in, 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 in recompense for this, $100,000 plus for the rest of her life, she gets free medical care, which is financed by the woman who takes the, uh, the, uh, the kidney. The woman who takes the kidney is in constant contact. I I'm speaking of an actual situation which arose. The woman, constant contact with this, uh, this uh, person who donated the kidney and they're in good relations. Now, this is obviously still trafficking in organs because it's an offense, okay, to take an organ from someone else. It's not legal, okay? However, is it trafficking in human beings? Remember, trafficking in human beings is very severe, offending autonomy, dignity, and freedom. Has this woman been objectified? On the other hand, I'll give you an example of a case in Israel well, we can see the objectification. Okay? This was a case in which there appeared an advertisement in an Arab newspaper, Arab citizens of Israel and have newspapers. And it said, um, anybody who wants a, a monetary prize should donate a kidney, sign Dr. Muhammad. So to Dr. Muhammad came five people two of them who are on the edge of bankruptcy, one a single mother who was in very bad economic straits, one uh, a person who was on the verge of mental retardation, who had had problems with his family, and the third, an Islamic altruist who thought it was a good thing to donate a, a kidney. So Dr. Mohammed says, okay, I'll give you $7,000 for these kidneys, and, um, it's a very simple operation. You'll be back at work two weeks. Uh, okay, 
All right, so they agree. And then two of them want to renege on their, uh, on their uh, agreement. So Dr. Muhammad, who by the way is no doctor, it's complete deceit, takes them into his house, uh, takes away their passports. In the end, all five are transported to the Ukraine and their kidneys are taken from them. When they come back to Israel, not one of them gets the whole money, the whole sum of money. The most anybody gets is $3,000. The others get nothing. And this is a case of the people who stayed in the traffickers' home are told, oh, but you ate and you got accommodation, so you owe me. I don't owe you, okay? Now, in this case, uh, there was a plea bargain, but the people were, the accused persons were convicted of trafficking for removal of organs. Look at the difference between this case and the first case. It's clear. In this case, these people were objectified. These people were deceived. These people were not given any medical treatment. I forgot to say that when they arrived in Israel. And the person on the verge of mental retardation uh, was so afraid to go to any medical uh, person because he had been threatened and told that he had committed the crime. So he took out his own stitches with a Japanese knife in his kitchen. So this is an extreme case, okay, where we can see the objectification. The challenge is, what about the cases in between? What about the gray areas? And that, that's problematic. I think each case we're just going to have to wrestle with. In addition, of course, the perpetrators in these cases are liable to be doctors, medical personnel. This requires more familiarity with that organizational climate. So these, these are problems that arise in the trafficking for removal of organs. Okay, thanks, Racha. So in a lot of your examples, you're giving um, international travel. And one of the questions is, how can we strengthen the cooperation between countries mm. to reduce um. the human trafficking? And this is from Burka. We actually, one of the brave souls who has his video on. Hi, Burka. Mm. Thank you for your question. Which? Who? Burka. Oh, hi. Ulasho. Hi, hi. I wish I could be of more assistance because my experience is not very wide in this area. Um, I know that UNODC does have a tool uh, about mutual legal assistance and how to develop it. I would say just from the top of my head and then having seen, it's, it's very worthwhile to develop relationships between countries, especially to develop relationships between countries in which you see a pattern of trafficking. And in developing relationships, I mean police to police, very, very important. Minister of Justice to Ministry of Justice. And, you know, so that when you have a case, you know who to go to. Even to work together in joint investigation teams would be a good thing. Um, I know that in Israel, they did succeed in doing that when uh, they created a special uh, trafficking unit in the police. They developed special relationships with um, police units in former Soviet Union republics in the Eastern Europe, uh, because that's where the women were trafficked from. And as a result of that, they did succeed in, a, in extraditing a major um, traffickers, one who was called Tarzan. If you like, uh, I can give you a link to the uh, UNODC um, tool, if, the, if that might help, or I can give it to Sarah, uh, you know, maybe that would help also. But I think that uh, you would need to consult a greater expert than me about that, that subject. Sorry that, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you can send me the, the link. And um, if anyone's interested, uh, you have our email in, your, in, your, in the email that you received for the link mm -hmm. to the Zoom. So you can send me an email and we'll send you, we'll send you the link. Oh, by um, the way, do, I don't know if you have a, a national coordinator in your country. Do you? Burka? Burka? Let me unmute you, sorry. What country are you from? From Ethiopia. 
Hi, Ethiopia. Do you have a national coordinator? Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. he should be a person who, who should be helping to do this. I say this as a former national coordinator. <laughs> it's, anyway, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, with your experience in Israel, I think we have time for one more question. And there's a question about what uh, strategies do we do here in Israel for awareness and awareness building? Hmm. Well, this is more, uh, you know, probably to the, to the current national coordinator, can only answer from the past. Well, first of all, uh, some of the things we did were uh, to produce a leaflet for the public. Okay, how do you identify victims of trafficking? We also produced a leaflet for professionals, a separate leaflet for professionals on how to identify. Another thing is constant trainings, constant trainings of various um, practitioners. And I think that bringing them together is terrifically important. Because there's something to be said for training prosecutors separately, labor inspectors separately, police separately. So it's very important. But to bring them all together develops a tremendously heightened awareness. Of course, information campaigns are always good, but as we heard from the Albanian nun, information itself is not enough. Okay, we need we need to give hope. Okay. Um, I think that even when there are, uh, um, how do you say it, deliberations in parliament about trafficking, which are broadcast in the media, it can be very useful in terms of uh, public awareness. I know that in our case, we had a member of parliament who was called Zahava Galon, who did a series of, um, she was head, uh, chairman of the trafficking committee, and she did a series of, of meetings which were which changed the entire public climate in Israel. Another thing that we do, and this was the uh, initiative of the head of the um, Agency for Women's Advancement, we give um, a decoration or a prize every year, every two years for three organizations or people who have fought trafficking. And this, uh, again, it is in the media, and it also gives positive feedback for people who are fighting and uh, alone, or give it to an NGO, a government worker, and an individual who has uh, fought trafficking. So th these are just a few. I'd say also turning to businesses is very important. For example, in the tourism, one of you asked the question about the tourism industry. And one of the things that my colleague, when we were in the coordination did was, have a series of meetings with the people in the tourism industry, how to develop an ethical uh, guidelines of how to deal with trafficking, because hotels are notorious for harboring uh, uh, victims of trafficking for prostitution, for example. Anyway, th those are just things off the top of my head. Great, oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yes. I want to give a very big thank you to you, Rachel, for taking the time and for sharing your vast knowledge with us. And um, it was actually fun. It was a lot of fun. I'm so happy to hear that it was I fun too. Yeah, no, I never addressed it only from vulnerability. So it was learning for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, and, and for all of us. So thank you again. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, just a reminder that there's the video that will be online. And if you are interested in the link, uh, please send us an email and we'll send you back an email uh, with the link for UNODC. The recording will be on our YouTube channel, Mashav Carmel Training Center. And once again, thank you so much, Rachel, for all Bye. of your time and your sharing your knowledge. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.